Welcome to another episode of The Tapestry. I'm Dr. Francois Booker-Drew, and here we weave life stories. This is an opportunity for you to listen to the stories of amazing women and learn more about how they've overcome tragedy, how they've been able to be triumphant, and some lessons that we can learn from them. And so today, we have another exceptional guest, a dear friend of mine that I've known for a number of years, and we're going to talk about that um, in a bit. But Joni Bryan fell in love with social impact work in 1995 at her first job, where she worked almost four years at a camp in East Texas. She has worked in the social impact world for nearly 25 years, focusing on social and environmental justice causes. She is the co-founder of Amplify, a nonprofit organization that exists to amplify underrepresented voices in technology and the founder of 940 Coaching, where she works with social impact organizations to design processes and build technology systems that help them achieve their mission. At 940, Joni also works with organizations to design more LGBTQIA inclusive processes, programs, outreach, and workplaces. As a white passing person with Cherokee ancestry, she recognizes her inherent privilege and contribution to a society that promotes racism, xenophobia, bigotry, and white supremacy. She actively works to recognize and dismantle these institutions through her work with organizations who are pursuing the same end as well as through amplifying marginalized voices around her. As a queer person and LGBTQIA activist in America, she is well acquainted by the challenges experienced by our LGBTQ and trans communities, particularly in the southern United States, and actively works to dismantle homophobia and transfo- transphobia Excuse me, through storytelling and education. And we're going to talk about this because Joni and I both are intrigued with stories. And she is a master's student at Saybrook University, where she is studying mind-body medicine and integrated health and uh, wellness. She lives in Denton, Texas, with her rainbow family, consisting of a husband, three teenagers, two dogs, and a cat. She loves animals. And so we're going to talk about... Um, being LGBTQIA in America. And I want to start with, I've known Joni since she was in college. Um, and just over the years, it's been such a pleasure to watch her just flourish and find her voice and just show up in spaces and do amazing work. And so, Joni, I know your journey, but I want you to share with others your journey. Talk about the difference between the Joni I knew at UNCD and who you are now and what's been the path for you? Wow, so that was an intimidating introduction. Um, I feel so much more important than I, I actually am. <laughs> you are important, <laughs> girl, huh? <laughs> so my journey has really taken me down a lot of different roads. Um, I I started out in uh, evangelical Christianity, the, the daughter of a pastor, a uh, music minister specifically, and his wife. Um, and they, they became charismatic during the Jesus movement in the 70s. And so I was raised very evangelical, very fundamentalist, um, and, and very sheltered, honestly, because I, I grew up in East Texas in Tyler, and we were, you know, with a small town back then, and so I spent my days reading, and that was my window to the world. Um, my family didn't believe in television, so there was, like, no movies, no TV. It was a very different life than my kids have today, uh, but it, it really gave me... Um, it taught me a lot in the sense that books have since sort of informed my worldview. And so I sort of lost myself in stories at a very early age. And I became very aware of how our stories create these webs and connections between us. Um, And I was always fascinated by hearing stories, regardless of whether they were true or not, I was just interested in hearing uh, people tell stories and reading stories in books. And so um, I grew up and I got married really young. 
Um, and <laughs> that marriage did not last, unfortunately, um, because I began asking a lot of questions. And one thing is about educating with books. Um, books teach you to ask questions. And research teaches you to ask more questions and ask them differently. And so because my mom had a firm belief in the library, she taught me the Dewey Decimal System super young. And so I learned the techniques of research in basically elementary school. And then I just applied them to my life. So that got me almost kicked out of Christian school in eighth grade. <laughs> um, and it gave me a hard time in fundamentalist Christianity for, for pretty much the entirety of my tenure in fundamentalist Christianity. Um, in my late 20s, I went back to school in, in the wake of my divorce and after having three kiddos. And I was getting my, um, my bachelor's finished up, and I, that's how I met you, Francois, mm -hmm. uh, through the Human Services Bachelor Program. And I remember um, you worked with World Vision at the time, yep. and you and I just hit it off immediately because yes. we were both so passionate about stories. Um, and I sort of yes. began unraveling that and following that trail of hearing people's stories and um, certainly reading people's stories, but hearing them as well. And so in my early 30s, I did a five-year research and writing project on women and religion. Um, and basically my question was, uh, how does our religious context frame our view and our actions in life as women in America? Um, and I really wasn't prepared for the answer. It was designed to be a six-month project where I was going to interview people from the top six religions in the U.S. And I was going to live each one for 30 days and do all my interviews and writing in that 30 days. And then um, six months later, I would have, you know, achieved my goal of experiencing the top six religions myself. And that's not what it turned out to be because I began to hear their stories and as I heard stories, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of exposure to other religions. And so began to hearing their stories about um, their connection to the divine and what they found in their religion around just community and connection and healing and really um, being able to process their trauma and also being able to be healed by that community power uh, was fascinating to me because I had grown up believing that Christianity sort of had the corner on all things healing and connection and my first group was a group of Muslim women and they were just incredible and they were saying so many of the things same things that I had felt about being a Christian. Like, it really gives me fulfillment, and it really makes me feel like I have a purpose, and I feel protected, and I feel safe, and I have this community of like-minded people around me, and we connect with the divine, and it feels right to me. And so I began talking with these women, and time after time, their stories just sounded the same. They were different details, but the same basic premise and I went through Mormonism, and I went through Judaism. Judaism, though, was very interesting because they were the only religion where they drank vodka shots and danced in the, the foyer um, after their service, which fascinated me entirely. Um, but, yeah, and by the end of it, I sort of abandoned my own God box, is what I call it. Um, I had unpacked that God box, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to reconstruct what I believe God is from my experience with the divine, and through a lens of believing, my foundational belief is that the divine is love, and God is love, and therefore, everything was going to go through that filter for me, um, I didn't know at the time that that was going to completely change my life and turn everything that I believed on its head. Um, and so it did. And I began experiencing these moments of connection with people everywhere. And I began wanting to show myself more because I had always been the interviewee or the interviewer. 
um, and not ever the person that really shared who she was because I felt part of me was just really not, it wasn't okay to share. It was kind of dirty and not really very pretty and not shiny. And I just wasn't really comfortable with really showing the world who I was. Um, and so I ended up switching careers and I began doing nonprofit consulting when I graduated. Um, and and specifically, I began doing nonprofit technology and process consulting, which was a completely different ballpark for me. Um, new career field, new segment, new ecosystem. And I was, I had this opportunity that a lot of us don't get to just completely start fresh. And I went into it and I said, you know what I'm going to do is an experiment because my whole life is experiments. I am going to do this experiment that I just I am authentically, vulnerably myself everywhere. That I don't hide who I am. And so that year, um, that first year, it was it was pretty insane. Um, I started Amplify in the community that I was part of for um, for technology. And Amplify was really around a central place in a technology community where people could be vulnerable, show the show up as themselves, help each other, provide mentoring, and share their story. And so after a year of Amplify, I was asked to speak at the National Salesforce Conference. And so I did. Um, and I was asked to speak about community building, which I kind of did. Um, what I actually did was I got on the stage and I told my story. And I told it publicly, and it was the first time I'd ever done that. And I'm standing there, and I'm shaking, and my knees are weak, and my hands are shaking, and I'm talking about who I am. And I said, you know what? I struggle with mental illness. I have bipolar mm -hmm. disorder. And I'm queer, and I've never really fit anywhere. But you know what this thing I believe is about love? I believe that there are so many love stories, and that community is built on these these love stories, these connections that people have and that they make between them. And I did my whole speech. Um, I had written down every single word because I'm not like you, Francois. I can't just talk off like bullet points. Um, <laughs> and I was so nervous. And I get done and I look up and, you know, I'm not doing very well on the whole making eye contact with the audience thing. But I look up and... I, I'm like going to try to find a place to drop this mic and get away from the stage. And as I look into the audience, um, I had strategically placed a few of my friends in places so that I could look like I was making eye contact, but really I was just looking at them. Um, and, it, and when I looked up, they were all standing and they were all clapping and the whole audience. And I was like, that's awesome. Wow. <laughs> And so I, I run away from the stage, and I'm standing there um, kind of by the stage because the, the person in charge of that session told the audience that I would be available for questions afterwards. Um, and so these people just start lining up, and they want to tell me their story. Because you empowered them and freed them in telling your own yeah. We were able to allow other people to be free and knowing that there's nothing shameful and dirty about being the person that you are. You are who you are. And you just liberated folks in doing that. Yeah, exactly. And it was amazing. And these people will just tell me these amazing stories. And now it happens all the time. I, I tell people my story and they tell me their story. And together we're weaving these love stories all throughout my life and it is so incredibly beautiful. 